When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues as of fire, and it rested upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In the early days of Christianity, a supernatural event impacted both the spiritual and earthly world. The Holy Spirit descended with unimaginable power upon the assembled disciples, filling them with divine fervor. Amazingly, they began to speak in languages they had never known, but what was the true meaning of this event? What consequences did this bring for them and for us? What really happened on that day of Pentecost? Why did this event mark the beginning of a new era in human history? Was it just an isolated event in time? Or is its power still latent, waiting to awaken in the hearts that are willing to receive it? All right, dear listener, we invite you to dive into the depths of Pentecost, an event you may have heard about before, but whose most surprising details might have gone unnoticed. Before we begin, I want to thank you for following us and being part of our ministry. We are a Christian team dedicated to faithfully spreading the Word of God, and your support is vital to us. The best way to help us is to share this message with all your friends and family. This allows us to continue spreading the gospel and reach more people with the message of Christ. Let's get started. We have reached chapter 2 of the Book of the Acts of the Apostles, and this chapter is important for Christianity because on the one hand, it tells us about the fulfillment of Christ's promise to His disciples. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And on the other hand, many consider this to be the day when the Lord's church was officially born. It is certainly a great passage in the Bible. Although it is found in a book of a predominantly historical nature, the truth is that, in addition to learning about the origins and first steps of the Church, it reveals to us essential doctrinal truths that, far from being mere dogmas, must become principles of life that lead us to experience the fullness of the presence of God in our lives. Dear listener, speaking about Pentecost is truly fascinating, as it reveals the beginning of the Church in Jerusalem, which would become responsible for bringing light to the world, manifesting the kingdom of God, and proclaiming the gospel to all nations. Now, to fully understand the event of Pentecost, it is essential to place ourselves in the context of Acts chapter 2. Luke, in Acts chapter 1, introduces us to the resurrected Christ. For 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples, confirming his resurrection and teaching them about the kingdom of God. These appearances were not only significant in reaffirming his identity as the risen Messiah, but they also gave the disciples a deeper understanding of his mission. The fact that Jesus spent time with them after his resurrection was crucial. He not only provided them with comfort and security, but also prepared them spiritually for the work that lay ahead. The teachings about the kingdom of God gave them a clear vision of their role in the expansion of the gospel. Thus, when Pentecost arrived, the disciples were ready to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, an event that would mark the beginning of a new era in the history of salvation. This context is key to understanding the transformation they would experience, going from being a scared and confused group to becoming a powerful and dynamic community that would change the world. Now, before his ascension, Jesus gave his disciples a clear order to remain in Jerusalem until they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. This baptism was essential to equip them with the power necessary to carry out their mission. Let's read Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said to them, You heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Luke recounts a meeting between the Lord and his disciples, who were in a room in Jerusalem. The risen Redeemer instructed them to remain in the city. However, you might ask, why Jerusalem? 
For them, it was a place of hatred, violence, and persecution. Nevertheless, the fulfillment of the Father's promise was destined to occur in Jerusalem. The coming of the Holy Spirit would take place in the same city where the Savior had been crucified. The Spirit's presence there would be a testimony to humanity's rejection of the Son of God. The Spirit of Truth would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, beginning precisely in Jerusalem. The disciples would receive the Holy Spirit in the place where they themselves had abandoned the Lord and fled in fear. Through this act, they would be strengthened and gain indomitable courage, becoming brave proclaimers of the gospel in the very place where they had previously shown weakness and fear. Let us note what verse 8 of this same chapter says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the key verse in the book of Acts. The main purpose of the baptism in the Spirit is to receive power to testify about Christ so that the lost will accept Him as their Savior and learn to obey everything He commanded. Thus Christ can be known, loved, adored, and made Lord of God's chosen people. The word power, Greek dunamis, goes beyond simply referring to strength or capacity. It implies above all power in action and in operation. Baptism in the Spirit will bring the personal power of the Holy Spirit into the life of the believer. In this passage, Luke does not link baptism in the Spirit with salvation and personal regeneration, but rather focuses on the power that is activated within the believer to witness effectively. Understanding that they had been commissioned to preach the gospel, they knew that this work did not depend on their own human strength or ability, but on the power of the Holy Spirit. Just as the Lord Jesus himself needed the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out his ministry, so would his disciples need it even more. After giving all these instructions, Jesus ascended into heaven and was taken before the eyes of his disciples. This event left the apostles expectant and full of uncertainty, but it also gave them the promise that they would not be alone since the Holy Spirit would come to guide them. Now, after the ascension, the disciples returned to Jerusalem and met in the upper room. There, they devoted their time to prayer and reflection. This period of waiting was essential to prepare spiritually for what was to come. Let's read verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. From the ascension of Jesus until Pentecost, ten days have passed, while from his resurrection until Pentecost, fifty days have passed. The day of Pentecost has arrived. Pentecost comes from the Greek word, Pentecoste, meaning fifty. Being a Greek term, it is not found in the Old Testament. This Jewish holiday was celebrated fifty days after Passover and was known as the Feast of Weeks, Feast of Harvest, and Day of First Fruits. It was the second of the three great festivals that Israel was commanded to keep in the National Sanctuary. On the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament, Israel received the law. On the day of Pentecost in the New Testament, the Church received the Spirit of Grace in fullness. It was the best attended of the great festivals, because the conditions for travel were at their best. There had never been a larger gathering in Jerusalem than this one. Now, there is something to note. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were all with one accord together. The more accurate Greek text mentions together in one place, using homo instead of homothymodon. This means that the emphasis on the word with one accord is not so necessary here. However, both the word homo and the general context indicate a unity of spirit among them. A more recent version states, they were all agreed in one place. Dear brothers, we see the power of unity and prayer. They were all gathered together, sharing the same heart, the same love for God, the same trust in His promise, and the same geography. Before we can be filled, we must recognize our emptiness. By coming together in prayer, in obedience, these disciples did exactly that. They recognized that they did not have the resources in themselves to do what they could or should do. They had to depend on the work of God. Let's continue reading verse 2 
And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The text says, Suddenly, meaning without warning and unexpectedly, the 120th disciples could not imagine how the Comforter would come. It is then mentioned that he came from heaven, the same place from which the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus at his baptism. This indicates that his origin is not earthly, that is, he does not come from a human being. Every gift that comes from heaven is the work of God, which means that the author of this event is God and its nature is supernatural. The text also mentions a roar. Roar in Greek is echoes, meaning noise or sound, similar to that of a violent wind that floated toward them, like the deafening noise of a hurricane. Then it says, as of a mighty wind that blew, which literally translates as a violent wind carried, that is, a wind that blows impetuously. Note that it was not a literal wind, but rather like wind. The sensory impression of those who lived that experience was that of a strong wind. The Greek word translated wind, P-N-O-E, appears in the New Testament only in this passage and in Acts chapter 17 verse 25, where it is interpreted as breath. Luke may have chosen to use the word P-N-O-E here as a description of the supernatural breath the disciples were about to experience. The roar of the mighty wind would evoke in these men and women familiar with the Hebrew scriptures the presence of the Holy Spirit, which manifests itself as the breath of God in moments of creation and renewal. From the movement of the waters in Genesis, to breathing life into man and revitalizing the dry bones of Israel in Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, as a result of this, it is said that he filled the whole house where they were sitting. Although the syntax suggests that noise is the subject of the verb, it is evident that the house was filled with the Holy Spirit, represented in the Gospel of John chapter 3 by the wind. The place where they were gathered was filled, as both sound and wind can quickly encompass every corner of a building. Thus, the coming of the Spirit filled the place where these Christians were. Let's continue reading verse 3. And there appeared to them cloven tongues as of fire, and it rested on each of them. The text says that there appeared to them cloven tongues. After receiving audible evidence of the Spirit's coming in the previous verse, they now had visible evidence of His presence. The parted tongues as of fire, in Greek suggests a fire dividing into smaller tongues, resting on each member of the assembled assembly. The figure of tongues is appropriate, considering the gift of speech that the Spirit granted to believers. Hackett correctly describes the scene by pointing out that the fiery appearance initially presented itself as a single body and then divided, so that a portion rested upon each of those present. It is important to note that the text clarifies that these tongues were not flames of fire, but rather resembled fire. All those present benefited from this supernatural event, as the text mentions that it settled upon each one of them. This is significant, as each person individually experienced the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, both verses 2 and 3 present two symbols, wind and fire. The meaning is too obvious to be mistaken. Fire like wind was symbolic of the divine presence. Let's read Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Wind and fire were an accepted symbol for the powerful and purifying operation of the Spirit of God. That is, when the Holy Spirit fills the heart of the believer, he gives him power and purity. No person can have one without having the other. To receive the Holy Spirit in His fullness is to experience both simultaneously. Now what was the purpose of this supernatural combination of sound and sight, of wind and fire? The parallel with what took place at Mount Sinai in connection with the giving of the law is most instructive. We read that there were thunder and lightning, and a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound. Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. 
A new age had come into existence. A new era had dawned. It was important for the Israelites to grasp the supreme importance of the moment. They must have been deeply conscious of the divine authority of the law that was being given to them. This was Pentecost. The dispensation of the Holy Spirit had been inaugurated. The disciples were to be aware of what was happening. The symbols of wind and fire would help them to understand the meaning of what was happening. Let us continue reading verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled. This event represents the fulfillment of the Father's promise and the joyful outcome of ten days of waiting and prayer. The disciples had learned to pray for the Spirit. Jesus had imparted the Spirit to them on a previous occasion, and now the promised Spirit took hold of them, filling their innermost being and urging them to the intense activation of all their faculties. The disciples, being filled with the Holy Spirit, were clothed with power from on high, enabling them to testify of Christ, to produce in the lost a great conviction of sin concerning sin, and of righteousness and the judgment of God, and to turn them from their sin unto salvation in Christ. The Holy Spirit revealed that by nature He longs and strives for the salvation of the people of every nation. Those who received the baptism in the Holy Spirit were filled with the same longing for the salvation of the human race. Thus, the day of Pentecost marks the beginning of worldwide missions. The disciples became ministers of the Spirit. Not only did they preach Christ crucified and risen, leading others to repentance and faith in Him, but they also influenced the converts to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which they themselves had received on the day of Pentecost. This leading of others to the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the key to apostolic work in the New Testament. Through this baptism in the Spirit, Christ's followers became successors of His earthly ministry. They continued to do and teach in the power of the Holy Spirit the very things that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, the text also says, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This indicates the immediate effect of the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. There was no waiting or learning period. They began to speak immediately, as it was a divine work. Other languages are mentioned, that is, languages other than one's own language. The word used refers primarily to the organ that enables speech and also to any language. The Spirit gave the disciples not only the gift of speaking in other tongues, but also the message. They spoke under the direct guidance of the Spirit. Let us continue reading verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. There were Jews, devout men, who had gathered in Jerusalem from all over the known world to observe the Feast of Pentecost. Now, verse 6 says, And when this sound occurred, a multitude came together and were confused, because every man heard them speaking in his own language. We believe that it refers to that noise like a strong wind blowing, which Jerusalem heard, and that is why the crowd gathered. This noise here was something the people of Jerusalem had never heard before, so they rushed out to see where the noise was coming from. And we believe that this took place in the area next to the temple, and that there were about 120 believers there as mentioned in chapter 1, verse 15 of this book of Acts. Now those who gathered there were confused, because not only did they speak the language of their country, but each person also heard his own dialect. That is, the way each language was spoken in a part of the country. But these men were not speaking something unintelligible. They were not speaking in unknown languages, but in the dialects of the people who were in the crowd. Let's continue reading verses 7 and 8. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How then do we hear them speaking each in our own language, in which we were born? Astonished is translated from a Greek word that literally means to be beside oneself. It refers to the astonishment that came upon those who witnessed the miracle of the gift of tongues. Furthermore, amazed has the connotation of a continued action. The more they heard, the more amazed they became. 
and they asked themselves, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? They were surprised that these Galileans spoke their own languages. The Galileans were considered to be uneducated people with very limited education, with a peculiar accent, and in general nothing special was expected of them. These men wondered how this could possibly be happening. Even though the miracle is before their eyes, the natural man tends to question, as he cannot understand what is happening. Although they heard the wonders of God expressed by these disciples of the Lord in their own language, their inability to understand them led them to confusion and disbelief. Thus, wonder was mixed with doubt, reflecting the struggle between faith and reason at such an extraordinary moment. Let's continue reading verses 12 and 13. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? Others mocked and said, They are full of new wine. In these verses we find two distinct groups. One of them was filled with wonder, marveling at what was happening and trying to understand the miracle of the gift of tongues. On the other hand, there was a second group who, seeing this extraordinary situation, decided to take it lightly, suggesting that the disciples were full of new wine, that is, that what they were witnessing was simply the result of having drunk too much. This group was mocking, possibly laughing, and regarding the disciples as madmen, unable to recognize the divine work manifesting before their eyes. The contrasting reaction of these groups reflects the diversity of human responses to the supernatural. Dear brothers, after this the Apostle Peter presents a speech and wins many souls for Christ, and the church grew. There was unity, generosity, empathy, and service, the work of the Holy Spirit towards all this. Today, this topic is the subject of much controversy, as some renowned theologians view this event as totally distorted. Their teachings have robbed the church of the privilege and power to experience the true work of God. As a server, I can testify that I have lived this reality in my own life and have seen how it has impacted many other people as well. This is not something that belongs only to the past. It is a current and transformative experience. It is crucial that we unite and seek in prayer the power from on high, seeking to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and filled with His power. Only in this way will we be able to carry out God's work with the strength necessary to perform signs and wonders that impact those around us. The need for this power in our lives is more relevant than ever, and we must yearn for it fervently. We must finish for today. It is evident that the passage we have studied has a main protagonist, the Holy Spirit. Dear listener, you will remember that speaking to his own shortly before his death, Jesus, when announcing his departure, also told them that the Holy Spirit would come. If you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit will come and empower you and equip you with authority for effective service. Then you will begin to enjoy all the resources that God offers His children, along with the strength and comfort to cope with the ever-changing circumstances of life. Because the Bible says so, and we, from our own experience, also confirm it, we want you to know that it is worth being a child of God. And so we come to the end of this video. Thank you for being part of our channel. God bless you abundantly. Until the next video.